Hey everybody, it's Tom Joya from Visionary Music Group. Hope you're all doing great. I have my top 20 mixing tips for 2020. Here we go. Mix tip number one, save as. As soon as you get a session from a client or a song you're working on and you're preparing to mix, hit the save as button and rename it. So in my case, you send me something to mix, I open it up, I take a listen, I immediately hit the save as button and it's your song title and my initials. So I know any work I want to do moving ahead, I'm not going to destroy anything you had that you liked in your session. I can always go back to your original. And then you can keep saving as each step of the way and renaming so you can always go back one session or go back two to find your way back. So use the save as command to help you. Mix tip number two, color coding. It may seem overly OCD, but if you have 150 tracks in a session and you're trying to find your drums, if your drums are always red, you'll always find them. So in every single session you have, mix session, color code your tracks by groups. So in my sessions, drums are always red, bass is always brown, vocal always green. So I can always find it instantly as I'm scrolling up and down through my track or edit window. Color coding. Mix tip number three, your track order and placement in your session. Okay, once again, back to that big session of scrolling up and down. So you have your colors. Now group them together. Put all your drums together and then put them in the same place in every session. So in my case, the first audio tracks you'll see are the drums, then the basses, then the guitar. And within that placement, you can get even more specific to help you move faster. Keep the order the same. So kicks for me are always first, then the kick samples. Snare drum, then the snare samples. And continue on in my bass group, let's say. Bass DI's first, then the bass amp is clean, then a dirty bass amp. So your track order and placement can really help you move quickly through a mix because you always know where everything is. Mix tip number four. Clean up all your tracks before you start mixing. So imagine this scenario. You have all these tracks and you've organized them, you've color coded them, and you're mixing and there's all kinds of things going on. Then you start hearing noises you didn't hear. Clicks, pops, headphone bleed, microphone noises, mouth noises, buzzing. And you're just about at this point to get ready and be really creative, engage your automation, and do the creative part of mixing. Guess what? You have to stop now and go back and clean everything. Do it first. Go through all the headphone bleed, the mouth noises, the popping, the clicking. Make your nice crossfades. Make everything perfect sounding. Do your audio made work first before you start mixing, then you can be totally creative when you're mixing. In fact, I don't even like to mix things on the same day I've done all the cleanup and done all the editing. I would much prefer to do all my cleanup, my color coding, importing, everything we're gonna talk about in these tips, and then I'm ready to mix. Then I have fresh ears and a fresh brain, and I'll do my mixing that day. So, clean your tracks before you mix. Mix tip number five. Clip gain your audio before you begin automation. So we're all trying to get a great static mix, meaning all the faders are up and it sounds as good as possible without engaging too much automation. But let's say your vocal track has a really quiet verse and a really loud chorus, and you think, oh, should I automate? Or let's say there's a the guitar plays quiet in one part and loud in another. So you separate your regions, and then at the beginning of each region, there's a small little fader and you can actually turn it up or down and that affects the audio. So you can make the quiet part louder and the loud part a little softer, getting them in the same general region so you don't have to engage automation. You can have a really nice static mix to play for your client before or listen to for a while till you make decisions. In my case, a lot of times I get a good static mix and I might just pull it all down and start over real fast. And if I have all this automation, I have to try to undo it or trim it and it really creates way more work. So use clip gain to balance your levels before you automate. Mix tip number six, make playlists. They can save your butt when you're mixing and editing. Let's say we're gonna do all those editing things we talked about in previous tips. So what I do when I first have a session, after it's organized and color coded, I duplicate every playlist. So anything I wanna move ahead on and edit, I know I can always go back to the original playlist and edit it back in if I make a mistake. So for instance, I duplicate the lead vocal playlist and I'm going to call it LVCG for lead vocal clip gain. Then I'm going to cut up my areas and do all my clip gain. And then if I'm happy with it, 
it's good. If I want to do more, I'll duplicate it again and call it LVCG2. So you always know you can go back one playlist and find what you need. Make playlists before you start doing any editing or any clip gaining or any other work in your mix. Mix tip number seven, using auxiliary channels as submasters. How many times have you had a session where you had the lead vocal, doubles, triples, and you wanted to process them? So you work on the lead vocal and you have four plugins, let's say, on it. Or let's say you have a piece of analog outboard gear, like all this great stuff back here. You insert that on there. Then you want to do the same pretty much to all the other vocals. So you cut and paste your plugins, and all of a sudden you're doing this a lot and your computer starts to slow down. And if you only have one pull tech or one specific compressor, you can only put that on one of the vocals. So if you make an aux submaster channel, you can route all of the vocals to this one channel and process that with the four plugins. So if you had 10 background vocals and you had three plugins on each, that's 30 plugins. If you sent it to one aux master, that would only be three plugins. And what's really great about this is, let's say a typical thing I might do, besides the, the scenario with the vocals, is my kick, I always want a pull tech and 1176. Same thing with the snare. But I may have kick one, kick two, kick sample, ambient kick, inside, outside mic. So I can move that all to a submaster and process it there. Use your submaster channels to help you save time and save processing power. Mix tip number eight using VCA masters. The common question now is, well, you just told me to set up these auxiliary submasters. Why do we need VCA masters too? Well, a few reasons. Number one, they take up no processing. Number two, VCA masters are used to control volume and muting. On an auxiliary submaster, if you turn up and down the volume, it may affect how the compressor works or change the sound of the limiter. On a VCA master, when I touch this fader and move it up and down, I'm only affecting the volume. And an added benefit of the VCA masters, there's actually two added benefits, is if you have all your groups down to a one VCA master, let's say I have all my drums and percussion on one, all my basses on the other, all my guitars on the other, etc. I may have six or eight faders in front of me that I can easily control macro moves on a whole mix. So let's say you need to give someone a TV mix you just mute the VCA master on the lead vocal and they have everything else done. So use VCA masters to help you be more creative and move quicker when you're mixing. Mix tip number nine, using markers to navigate your session. The obvious choice of using markers would be to help you navigate the arrangement. So marker number one might be the intro, two might be the verse, three might be the pre-chorus and chorus, bridge, etc. They're great, I use them all the time. Here's a couple of more added benefits. If you want to navigate the session without seeing all these tracks, you can use markers for that. So there's a track visibility function in the markers and Pro Tools. Let's say I have those 150 tracks in the session, and I just want to work on the drums or the background vocals for a while. I'll have a marker that the track visibility only shows me those things I want to work on. So I always know this marker over here is always for drums. This one's always for background vocals. So when I hit the marker, that's all I see and I don't have to page up and down. You hit that page up and down button on your keyboard enough, pretty soon you've added an hour of time to your mixing. So use markers to help you navigate your session. Mix tip 10, using aux channels for your effects sends and returns. So let's say you have your lead vocal and you decided, oh, I wanna put a nice reverb on it. So you put your plate reverb on an insert on that vocal channel. Then you do the same with a delay. Then you eventually have eight vocal tracks with harmonies, doubles, whatever. So then you're copying these to every channel. So now you have eight instances of each plugin on every channel. Pretty soon, your computer's slowing down, your sessions aren't moving as fast. They're all gonna be the same treatment. So why not just have one aux channel as your effects return for your reverb and one for your delay? And then you have a bus, which costs you no processing on each of the vocal channels and you can send as much or as little as you like right to those two channels. If you want more delay, less delay, etc., they can go there and now you only have two instances. So use auxiliary channels for your effects sends and returns. Mix tip number 11. We can use aux channels as send and returns for parallel effects. As we talked earlier in the last tip, we use the parallel effects 
of reverb and delay for a vocal. Let's say you want to make the vocal sound more in your face, but you don't want to compress it. You make another bus and another aux channel and put a compressor hitting super hard and then send the lead vocal to that and it pushes it to the front of the mix and gets it a little ahead of all the other vocals. On my mix sessions, I have an overall bus for my drums and bass. So whatever the blend is on my faders of that, I copy that blend to a bus and that goes specifically to my API 2500 compressor. I set it one way, I never change it. And if I want them to hit harder or softer, I push that up and down depending upon the feel I want for the song. And what's nice is you can automate that in the choruses so they pop more, you can turn it down in the verses. And it's kind of a glue that keeps the rhythm section together. What's happening is, is I can dial in as much or as little of these things as I want because I'm using the aux channel to send and return to it. Use aux channels to send and return in your session for parallel compression and EQ effects. Mix tip 12. Making a mix template. After all these tips we've been through, you're probably thinking, this is going to take me forever to set this up every time I do a session. All these aux sends and returns, parallel sends and returns. Oh, there's stuff on my mix bus. I don't even want to mix. So you make a template and you save it on a day that you're not mixing. So when the day comes to mix, you pop open your mix template and you import your tracks in or vice versa, depending upon what the session needs. For instance, in my mix template, I have everything set up. I have my two bus processing. I have all my side chain effects, my grouping to compressor sends. I have all my sends and returns of all my effects for everything, reverbs, delays, for vocals, for instruments. And then I have all the auxes for groups and the VCAs, as we discussed earlier. So I'm ready to go. And then the only thing that has to happen is I have to import my audio and route outputs to that. So that's super important uh, because you can spend much, much more time mixing. Make a mix template when you're not mixing and it'll save you time when you are. Mix tip number 13. Use high and low pass filters. If you ever notice, if you listen to mixes by some of the great mixers, everything sounds so clean and even and it sounds like it has a place. That's because there's nothing in their mixes that doesn't have a place. So if you went through your mixes and just soloed everything, one instrument at a time, and you took a filter and rolled out as much low end as you can, and you did the same thing on the high end, so it's not disturbing the sound, all of a sudden you'll start to realize just when you put it up, everything sounds clearer. Like for me, I take the Fab Filter Pro Q2 and I put that on all my tracks and I just really quick sweep up the bottom, sweep down the highs, soloed. So now I know that everything's clean. Let's take that a step further. Let's say you have some really good detuned guitars and they're big and they're bad, but I don't know, you can't make out the low end of the bass now because you hear them. You could solo the guitars and the bass that are interacting and then figure out, oh, I got to filter out the guitar a little bit. Or you could leave everything on and filter it out to make room. Same thing with the bass and the kick. Same thing with something that's got a lot of high end that's having activity with other parts in the high end. So you can sort of high and low pass filter it soloed and then maybe high and low pass filter them in groups or do it with everything in and see how your mix changes. It's a good experiment and it's, it's a good practice. So use your high and low pass filters to clean up your mix and make room for things. Mix tip number 14, use your solo button sometimes. The solo button's a great tool for editing, your high and low pass filtering, and zoning in on specific problems. But nobody listens to a song this way. They always listen to a song with everything because that's the mix you give them. So, a mix that sounds great may have some really weird sounding things done to the tracks when they're soloed. In fact, they may sound horrible when they're soloed, but when they're together, it works. Use the solo button when you need it, and then try not to use it too much. Mix tip number 15, the bypass button. If you put a compressor and EQ on there, hit the bypass button and listen to it in context with the mix and see if it's better. If it's not, you don't need it. Or maybe you went too far. And then you can do that with groups of instruments or with anything you've processed. 
just bypass it. And in fact, the mute button's kind of an extension of the bypass. If there's a lot of parts in a song and something's fighting somewhere, just mute some things and you might not really need a part or you might decide to treat the parts differently. So use the bypass button and the mute button. Mix tip number 16, mixing at a lower volume. When you want to get a little excitement, of course you want to mix a little louder. But at a certain point, you should mix at a lower volume because if the mix sounds exciting low, it's going to sound really exciting when it's loud. But if you can make it sound great at low volumes, it will definitely sound great at high volumes. So utilize mixing at low volumes. Mix tip number 17, take breaks. So your ears are important and having them not be fatigued is going to help your mixes and extend the life of your career. Every 40 or 45 minutes, it's good to take a five minute break. Get up, move around. It'll help your ears, it'll help your brain, it'll help your body, it'll help your mixes. So take breaks. Mix tip number 18, the three element rule. I've studied and listened to every video of all the other great mixers, and many of them have said the same thing, that our brains can really only focus on three elements in a song or a mix. Let's think about this in a rock song or a pop song. What are we really listening to? There's the vocal would be the most important element. Then probably the snare. And then the third could be some other sub hook or guitar or comping or something that identifies the song. If you prioritize your time on those three elements in a descending order, then you'll learn to not sweat all these other decisions about these other elements in the song. And those will be your focus. So just remember, you don't want to spend six hours on some element that's not one of those three main things in that section of your song, because it probably doesn't matter that much. So focus on three elements when you're mixing, because that's all the listener can focus on. Mix tip number 19, automation is your friend. So what do I mean by that? We're all striving to have a great static mix. A great static mix means you haven't done any automation at all. The faders are sitting where they're sitting and it sounds really good. Automation can be used for so many things to bring dynamics and life to a song in a way that maybe wasn't built into the arrangement. You don't have to just automate volume. You can also automate other elements. Panning's a great thing to automate. So let's say you have these wide guitars, they blow up in the chorus and they're super wide. You can automate the panning in a little bit and then when you get to the chorus, explode them outward so the chorus has this big payoff. So think about all the different things you can use automation for after you have that great static mix and use it because automation is your friend. And mix tip number 20, try to work like a sculptor. A sculptor has a large rock and makes it smaller and smaller but he works in broad strokes first, then he chisels down little details. So his work is wider and then more narrower. So think you're working generally and then funneling down to more precise each time. So for instance, in my ideal workflow, which I've sort of explained in prior tips, is I'll take care of all my cleaning, all my organizing, all my importing, all my color coding, all that stuff that's non-creative, that's technical work on day one. And I may do a few songs on day one. Then on day two, I've done all the big broad strokes. I can start a little more narrow. And then at the end of the day, they get even more detailed. Using this method separates the technical problem solving stage from the creative mixing stage. So get out your chisel and start sculpting. Broad strokes first, then get down to details. This tip is kind of a two part mix tip using metering and reference mixes. If you can compare your song to two or three other popular songs in a similar genre done by pro guys that have been mastered in the, on the radio, you'll have a really good ballpark tracking where you should be. This can be difficult because if you have a mix by someone that's been mastered, it's going to be way louder than yours. So you want to level match them. When I'm doing these, these videos, I want it to be generalized and I don't really promote a specific product. But there's a great plugin I've been using. It's by uh, Plugin Alliance Brainworks Adapter. It's a metering tool. And it allows you to really comprehensive metering, but it lets you put reference mixes in there and it lets you match their levels to what you're at. So you can truly A, B and reference where you're at and you could also compare them on a meter. 
So reference your favorite mixes that are similar to what you're working on and use your metering to help your ears see.